You never know where he will go. It's just a circuitous route, I believe they say. But uh, thank you, Frank. And this is a way to lead into Rome's never-ending quest, once she tastes empire, to take more. Some could say maybe the Romans didn't really mean for it to happen this way, but people did come along who seemed to have been, shall we say, greatly helpful to it. Philip V. Now, if you just go onto the web and put in Philip of Macedonia, this is not the person you're going to get. Um, Philip V is more the kind of individual that if you are a specialist or you're a Hellenistic person, you'll come across. I mean, he's very important, but let's face it, when the if you go out with regular people, and you may talk history with regular people sometimes, non ali folk, who uh, speak of Philip of Macedonia, and they will say, oh, you mean the father of Alexander the Great? And you go, oh, Peshaw, no. <laughs> <laughs> Only the elitist would know that we are talking about one of the great and quite aggressive Hellenistic monarchs of a much, well, not that much later, but a later period. Attractive, charismatic, and ambitious pretty well summarizes him. He had, for that day, a great career. We'll look at a map soon enough, but here is what I want you to remember, that he basically tied up his kingdom of Macedonia and northern Greece in with Carthage. And you know what they say? It seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> you know? Oh, Carthaginians, the great navy, lots of prosperity. However, um, it uh, came to pass that that was an error. And some of his other actions were unfortunate for him. With the cooperation of the Seleucids in the east, another one of those Hellenistic families you may remember, he temporarily got control of Egypt, or at least Alexandria, while the pharaoh was just a boy. I'm sure he was able to maneuver himself into a relationship with some of the advisors of the boy king. All of this is to say that he did have his time. However, Philip V will pay because Rome is aware of all of this and it's sort of like you will have to pay for this. And that means, of course, that because of Rome's strength, as she indicated in the first Punic War, by the time of the second Punic War, Rome, even in the East, is beginning to have the appeal of an arbitrator. And if that sounds vaguely familiar in modern history, so be it. But you understand what I'm saying. It's like the enemies of Philip V said, well, you know, Rome won't like it that you were doing this, so we're going to tell on you. And the Romans will come in and basically tell Philip V, you know, you really aren't being fair to the other people here. And so we're going to have to step in unless you police yourself. You need to exercise some self-control. Well, the idea then is Rome as the international policeman. And then when they don't get it exactly the way they want it, then the Romans will say, 
Well, maybe we can just maintain the peace by occupying all of it. And then we can save the peace by ruling you. And, of course, we didn't ask for any votes. All opposed say, no, we didn't ask that. And, of course, that means Romans in the East. Bringing the Pax Romana, Roman peace, to the East as well as to the West. And I suspect that these uh, people like Philip V helped bring it about with their maneuverings. But, I mean, they are humans. This whole thing about trying to take over this and take over that provides a perfect opportunity for the Romans to kind of sit on Philip V and, as we'd say, put the quietus on him because he made the mistake of associating with Carthage. So, what do we have? Well, this is a map that would show, I guess you'd say, the before part of the Roman experience. And you see, as you will recall, the various Hellenistic kingdoms I trust. And as I said, back when we talked about it, these are movable borders. These borders, they look pretty on a map, but you will understand that that could be like your accounts on Dow Jones go up and down <laughs> a little here and there depending on the week. You never know where it might be because those Seleucids and Antigonids and such are not planning to stay still. They're planning to grow and, and of course at some is expense, isn't it? So, we have that and you can see uh, the kingdom of Macedon there in that uh, aquamarine color, I guess you'd say. Okay, now let's go after. Uh, this is show, showing you, let's go gold, folks. Ignore that orange. It's very pretty orange. But ignore the orange because we'll come to that later. That's kind of like dessert. The gold is where we are right now. And again, as you have these territories, you have Spain, Carthage, Macedon. Those are the territories they will take. And you say, well, as many of us would now, after we've had our salad and entree, we're full. But you may know people who want even more, okay? And I'm afraid that's what happens to Rome. They just don't want to stop, and they can't say, well, gosh, we just want you all to be happy, and we want to be your friends. That, that'll work for a while, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, the uh, wars that will go on among these various quote-unquote allies, like Egyptian rulers and all the rest, finally the Romans are going to say, we just don't need any more of that. You all are disturbing the Roman peace. So, we're taking everybody. And that, of course will bring about, if you want to add the areas of Egypt, and you see Syria up here, all of that is going to accrue in the end to Roman authority, and we say a fond farewell to the Seleucid, Ptolemaic, and Antigonid monarchs. It was real. We've had a good time. It will last until... Well, practically the end of the first century B.C., if you want to talk about the annex. Look at Syria, and then you think about the annexation of what is today Israel and that territory when the uh, Jews came under Roman control. That's going to be very important. That's first century B.C. If you want to connect all that up with what I'm describing here, and it's not exactly the fulfillment of a domino theory, I think, 
But I do believe that it does have so much to do with the fact that the Romans self-asserted desire to have peace among all of these rival powers justifies, at least in Roman minds, her decision to take it all over because you think, golly, you're just asking for more and more problems for yourself. But ask Rudyard Kipling about the British. I mean, that's what we do. We are... We, are, we were put on this earth to guide and govern the others. And that's, but don't thank us. We're just glad to do it. We can help all the little people everywhere. You know, you understand there's always that attitude of Roman superiority in this period. So, as Frank pointed out to us, wars, wars, and more wars. Believe me. Even the most devoted Romanophile, I think, would not want to hear a description of each and every one of these wars. I think the pain and the heartache that you would experience if these doors were bolted, if I could do that, <laughs> and said, and now we're going to go through every one of the wars, you'd be hurting. You would be begging, begging mercifully. You would give so generously to <laughs> tomorrow to the Olive Fund, anything to get out. <laughs> so it, it, it is not going to be part of our problem to see each one of those. But it is very interesting, I think, to see the effects of them. Because as we come to this, we understand that wars have consequences. And as we know in our own time, one of the most significant is the existence of a vast population of veterans. We never forget that. What are we going to do with all of the veterans? And this is going to be a major problem. Particularly because when we think about the Republic, we remember the kind of people who were serving in all of these wars. There was a property qualification. In other words, you couldn't just come off the street and say, I want to be in the army. Unfortunately for these men, many of them lost their lands while they were all fighting for Rome. So what we will have then is the growth of a state's, plural, second declension, latifundia. These are the great estates of the landed aristocracy of the Romans. And instead of allowing these veterans to have their old lands back, they simply had taken them over. This could be because of debt or whatever the case. But meanwhile, the number of slaves is growing at such a great rate that Italy as a whole is changing because if you have slave labor, and you do thanks to all the wars, because that's how a lot of these folks are coming in, all these slaves. They are people from various areas that have been conquered by Rome. They uh, work the land. And I suppose in the views of these wealthy Roman owners of Latifundia are easier to work than using the veterans whose lands they ought to be. I mean, it's a very, very bad situation. But if you're talking, as we do today, about the areas of the unemployed and the homeless and all the rest, consider this as another example of that same tendency. You have uh, slave labor to do all this kind of work. And the Latifundia will be 
the kind of agricultural units we have as opposed to the small farms that existed in past. In other words, Rome is seeing as a result of wars some terrible social and economic problems. Now that's not to say everybody is uh, suffering. I remember, uh, as I'm sure you do, studying the Great Depression and then suddenly getting older and finding out that everybody wasn't poor. I mean, it, you know what you say, oh, you mean there were rich people then? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, that, there's some folks who are doing very well, thank you very much. Um, so it's not to say that this is totally disastrous, but it is for people that would be considered a highly significant part of the Roman plebeian class. And here are the ones who thought they could solve it. Their names have come down to us in history. They are of the highest social rank, Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus. We will talk more about their families and we'll have some artwork to show you as well because the idea of the two brothers sort of captures our imagination, sort of like a Jack and Bobby, I suppose. Uh, they were 10 years in difference, in, in age difference, but they were both tribunes. In other words, though... They were of the highest class. They had that sense um, of noblesse oblige that they could solve the problems or at least help to solve the problems through their position as tribune. The problem, of course, is going to be there are vested interests opposed and sometimes these two, Tiberius and Gaius, could be troubling. Forgive my turning so much to art and statuary, but I can't resist, so I, I didn't even try. <laughs> you know, it's like I went wild. Their mother, oh, the family was the bluest of bloods. Oh, God. The grandfather was Scipio Africanus. Mm. So that was, uh, that was mother's father. So you think that they didn't hear about grandfather? And they, well, your grandfather was this and then the other. So you hear that a lot. So I'm sure. And Cornelia was, and you see from the illustration, the idea of the idea of mother. You say, but what about the father? Well, he was okay. He was... But he was a plebeian, yeah. Uh, but he had, but he had money, uh, so don't worry. I mean, that's not. I mean, he had he had something going for him. I mean, uh, he's a nice guy. But he died uh, early early on, so let's just say he's not going to play a, mo a major uh, part in the story, except just for breeding purposes. But we got him, and then. These are mine, and they are really great. Uh, this is in Paris. Uh, 19th century, and I just, I just love it. I'll just admit it. I really do. Because mother and boys. And again, the idea of Roman duty and service is clear even in the little tyke's face. In other words, we are not going in for licentiousness and debauchery. No, mother, you have nothing to worry about. We are all about Rome and how we can make Rome. Well, your grandfather would be pleased. So says she. Not that she didn't have good offers. This particular drawing, or painting rather, shows her with the Egyptian Hellenistic ruler 
with the name Ptolemy. Yes, another Ptolemy. And Ptolemy apparently came all the way to Rome because he'd heard about the widow. Yeah, so he was coming courting. So he said, wow, I know your dad was Scipio Africanus and you're such a, you know, you're great. You have wonderful children. I just love everything about you. And he says, and she says, you see my, my children, I mean, you're nice. Egypt's great and all that. But I'd just rather stay single. So have a nice trip back to Alexandria. You know, it's like uh, that. The gist of this, that she would remain a widow all of her, a very long life. She outlived her sons. Yeah. And uh, she, she was quite an interesting figure indeed. Now this is, I think, 18th, maybe 19th century art. Look at those hairdos, huh? Now, notice mother and notice the guest. There's one thing to notice in the difference between the two women. One has not a shred of jewelry on, and the other one is gussied up like she has just come from where? Well, there is a point to this. And if you've never heard the anecdote, it is that uh, the one with all the fine jewelry says, Oh, Cornelia, where are your gems? Cor, she says, here they are. <laughs> and so those boys... <laughs> I guess they needed psychological counseling after. <laughs> I mean, there were some fairly serious expectations put upon them if the stories of their upbringing by Cornelia are true. That they were, and of course, grandfather is always uh, thrown up. But they apparently according to Plutarch and other sources, were uh, precisely what one would want in terms of their military service, their devotion to Rome, and you look for any signs of debauchery, licentiousness, sloth? No, no, none of this. Totally negative. It's all about duty and service, etc. So, what could go wrong? Well, what could go wrong is that when the elder Tiberius with the other tribunes launches this bold proposal to take lands that have been essentially taken dis by dispossessed now veterans, he suggests that these lands be converted over to farms for individuals who are now unemployed and dispossessed. I suspect he had a dream of restoring Rome to the older Rome. The idea that you could take these folks and put them back on the land, restore a kind of agrarian society, and then Rome would no longer have the problem of unemployment and all the rest that we associate with the growing problems that empire brings. Because the lands that many of these Latifundia included would be lands that the government had taken from the dispossessed while they were in military service. They really did. I mean, they, could, they just couldn't keep up. It's just like uh, even today, you know, if you can't keep up your payments, here comes the repo folks. 
And that's true back then, too. And you think, well, they wouldn't do that to a battle run. Well, yes, they would in a heartbeat. And there were lots of these cases. And he had this, I would think, rather romantic idea that everyone is going to agree. And that then you move all these people out of the cities and say, now, you'll be just like your granddaddy. And think about how nice that'll be and y'all can... Uh, farm and hoe and pig, and it's going to be great. I bet you're going to enjoy this. <laughs> uh, well, that was his idea, at least. Uh, here is the way Plutarch puts it. I couldn't resist quoting. Uh, Numentia is a part of Spain, by the way. So when Tiberius, on his way to Numentia, passed through Etruria, and you know the Etruscan area, northeast, found the country almost depopulated, and his husbandmen and shepherds were imported barbarian slaves. We know about barbarians, right? Uh, he first conceived of the policy which was to be the source of countless ills to himself and his brother. Then the poor who had been ejected from their land no longer showed themselves eager for military service and neglected the bringing up of children so that soon all Italy was conscious of a dearth of freemen, filled with gangs of foreign slaves, by whose aid the rich cultivated their estates from which they had driven away the free citizens. This is a kind of romantic narrative, isn't it, that Italy had been taken over by the few who had then imported all these slaves, and then the previous owners had never had any further opportunities. And this is what Tiberius supposedly said, presumably to other tribunes, as he was making his pitch. The wild beasts that roam over Italy have their dens. Each has a place of repose and refuge, but the men who fight and die for Italy enjoy nothing but the air and light. Without house or home, they wander about with their wives and children. So, uh, this some view as great patriotism, a great sense of, I guess, what we would call social conscience, and others view it as nothing more than cheap demagoguery. He's trying to be Mr. Big Stuff. He wants to make the big name. And he's not even a senator. Yes, he's a tribune. And obviously that is a position of great authority. But, He's also fighting against an enormous power block at the This is 133, so kind of keep up if you can with the time. We're sort of, you know, this is it, during the Punic Wars. So I don't want you to think they're not doing anything. The rest of the world's going on. So they're definitely fighting. So there are lots of other issues. But what's interesting about this is the response. And of course, 10 years later, they're going to bring up even other issues. Gaius will do this. I thought these were just some other interesting issues. Now they would even take virtually all public lands, not merely that that had been repossessed. We're talking about some serious land splitting up, and we know how that goes. You know how people don't like that. Don't like it a bit. We found that in the 20th century, the Russian Revolution, and elsewhere. You don't mess with my land. Clothing for soldiers with no deduction in pay. I thought that was sort of interesting that people had to pay for their uniforms. But you don't stop and think that in the past, people who did military service had property of their own. Might be not, they're not rich, but they got property. So they were expected to furnish their own um, outfits. 
So, no, you don't get any of the, that's just not part of it. So, it's interesting. No conscription for people under 17. Um, I think that's fine. Grain prices could vary depending on the level of the person who's buying the grain. And finally, and this one would really um, Italians having these rights that Romans say of. I don't know, yeah, I don't think the, uh, they necessarily were too happy about that <laughs> because they are so jealous, I guess, of their particular powers and they just didn't want to share. But the Italians, um, they would have nothing less, and this would go on for quite some time, as Frank was saying. Again, more wars. Remember the social wars, Frank. So this, in fact, then, is something that 10 years later, the younger brother, Gaius, would suggest. And he is going to meet a similar fate to that of his brother, ten years before, which is, of course, his death. Usually in popular... Now, how is this for, rom for romantic? Look at that painting. The death of Gaius. And you'll notice in the, that actually one of his slaves uh, actually executed him so they couldn't get a hold of him. And then... The slave, of course, commits suicide. So nobody wants to get left. And the idea, of course, is where are these people coming from? Well, presumably they are stooges of the Senate and other vested interests who simply don't want to listen to him anymore. I believe Tiberius had his brains bashed in. But the idea, but the idea is that these folks are not messing around. It's not like, well, let's sit down and reason together. Maybe we can come up with a compromise. Now we don't want any of that. Uh, and the Gracchi, of course, are great heroes. But they're dead great heroes because they simply uh, lack the kind of success that would symbolize someone who was transforming Rome. But it tells us the problems of the late Republic, doesn't it? That people will use violence to get what they want and that vested interests are not ready to make any major concessions. Um, okay. Optimus, yes, optimates. This was a group, and you say, oh, well, they were optimists, like the Optimist Club or something. No, <laughs> they called themselves the best people. And the populares are the popular people. But the popular people don't mean like the folks who actually work. Oh, perish the thought. This is merely a party within the Senate, and they say, we just love folks. You know, heart people, you know, that kind of thing. And so uh, that's the populares. Like the Gracchi, they probably have great services, saying, oh, we love you, Tiberius, we love you, Gaius, that kind of thing. Whereas the optimates are those that normally say, well, they don't actually say, you know, we have bloodthirsty monsters who are selfish, and they don't say that. Dude. No, they spin it. I'm just like that with spin. They spin it as if we are trying to preserve the best of our great past. We love Rome and we're not going to let you change it. You people, you have, you're doing everything to bring Rome down, and you ought to be ashamed. So, do they talk a lot? Yes, they do. But 
They also have groups, <laughs> and those groups carry out, of course, violence against each other. And you can imagine that if someone's making a speech, they can arrange for a nice crowd outside <laughs> to uh, give a big cheer <laughs> during the speech. I mean, that really makes you feel good, you know, knowing that all those people are out there going, boo, yay, <laughs> that sort of thing. That's true, though. Uh, demagogues uh, are not afraid to use that, and crowds can get right ugly. I mean, they're not like, oh, no, you were here first. Y'all y'all have finished, y'all then start later. <laughs> no, <laughs> you know that's not the way it works. So that's what's happening in the aftermath of these brothers. I had to bring in a French Revolution reference. I'm sorry, I don't mean to do these things, but it just seemed too good to resist. Now, if you were a student of the French Revolution when you were in school, this might have been a fill-in-the-blank on a test, but you may have forgotten it. It's not one of the biggies. This isn't Danton, no Robespierre, uh, but you'll notice his death date of 1797. And maybe you say, wow, I'm not sure I remember 1797. That's okay. If you remember 1799, the takeover of Napoleon, that's close enough. I'm pleased that you remember that. <laughs> 1797 was the period of the directory. And like, where is the love? We've just lost the sparkle. I mean, it just seemed like it was so wonderful. You know, the terror and eliminating enemies of the revolution. Those were great times, 1793, 1794. And it just seemed like we'd lost that feeling. No, I won't, I won't say. No, I'm not going to. I'm not a righteous brother. It's not happening. All I'm going to do is point out to you that it's now 1796-7, and this group of people led by this man, Babeuf, actually talked about dividing up the farmlands of France. Ooh. But look at the neat name he got, Gracchus. And he got that neat name before he went to the guillotine in 1797. So he knew about it. So uh, I just wanted to share how excited he must have been to get a classical Roman uh, name before uh, the head severance. So um, the name Gracchus is associated then with reforms, with change, with trying to create... Uh, a difference in society. And of course, their poor mother, as I say, she lost two sons and they were both young. And she went on uh, carefully because of political changes in the society. But I think in many ways, she was such a grand person that she was able to perpetuate their memory but at the same time, neither she nor anyone of her sort would be able to affect any change. In fact, the great changes would now come about by the generals. <laughs> it is going to become an increasingly military society. This painting of Marius and if you wonder where Marius is, he's in the ruins of Carthage. That's called Marius at the ruins of Carthage, and I, I don't know exactly why, but um, he was certainly a legendary figure. By Roman standards, he would have been considered... Um, well, Carol, it was novus homo, a new man. And you say, what does that mean? Well, it means that if someone asked, 
well, what's your background? <laughs> and you don't have much. Folks were just regular. They, they loved lives or they loved, you know, and they were, said, oh, you mean they work. So, uh, yeah, but that's okay. You made a big old bundle, and you are considered part and parcel of the higher class. And in this case, Marius accomplished this through his military feats. And he will certainly be one of the great military figures in our countless wars. Uh, he should have been getting lots and lots of veteran benefits. But I suspect he had more on his mind than just uh, getting benefits. Because in fact, Marius would break lots of Roman traditions that would significantly affect the future. Because as a very popular and successful general, and an individual who drew people to his cause, he will ignore uh, the limitations on generals and at the same time take all people who wanted to join his armies. Meaning that normally their loyalty would not necessarily be to Rome, but to him. Because if I'm your commander and I lose, so do you. But if I win, then you're a winner also. In other words, I will take care of mine. And he was a winner, often enough. The idea then of personal advancement in a Roman army is, is definitely a, a feature of this period in the last century and a half that people now see themselves. And you know why I think one reason? Because I think after all those wars, there have been so many casualties, they can't grow them fast enough. You know, the, that I just figure that this is necessary in terms of recruiting people, that the individuals who are not individuals who probably have a lot going on otherwise. And now they are told, basically, you can join this force. You can serve this general. Lots of great opportunities may be there for you. And then you're young and you consider your alternatives. Well, Marius never seemed to have any trouble with gaining capacity uh, for his Roman forces, so he must have been doing something right. But look who he was married to. Yes, the aunt of Julius Caesar. You can see where we're going with this story. And you're thinking, well, did they know that Julius Caesar was going to be big? Well, the family was big. I mean, they weren't just like beginners in society. Uh, this was a family of some note. And you're thinking, why would she marry him? Again, I think there is some intermarriage between levels of society so long as both have shall we say, means. And I think Marius and a woman from the family of Caesar would have both been, I mean the marriage planners and marriage arrangers would have seen them as a very good couple. I'm sure she had a nice dowry, lots of connections, etc. So for the purpose of connecting Marius to Julius Caesar, there's nothing like family, right? So it's interesting to note that, I think, as we move forward, because he will, of course, 
be a protege, that is, Julius Caesar, to Marius. Uh, now, wars, as I've indicated, we've got them, and in particular, as far as Marius is concerned, those that were going on in Italy, the social war, so to speak, and there were wars in North Africa, in the areas that we would probably call Morocco and um, all in Tunisia, yeah, all of that area that would have necessitated a great deal of military force. All of this is going on, and note, seven times a consul. Now you say, did they have to bend any of the rules for him to be con? Oh, they bent them all right. <laughs> And I don't think they asked for permission. It's sort of like now we're reaching the time of extra constitutionality. In case, <laughs> in case you're wondering, say, oh, well, is that going to be allowed? I think it will be. Uh, because if you have problems, Maybe Marius could bring his army and show you. Maybe the army could help you understand better. <laughs> you know, it's like that. It's kind of like bringing you back after your five-minute break, which you're entitled to now. <laughs> yes, if I had to bring a force to uh, show you the righteousness. Five minutes. I think some people made their escape. But... <laughs> Well, they'll have points off, I, you know. No. That is, yeah, that just, that's not a nice, uh, nice thing to do. So, that is a, that bus could have, I'm sure it been through a lot in its day to get, yes, yes, but apparently they do think that it was Marius or a facsimile thereof, if you wonder, he's certainly missing certain features, but, uh, the Marius look alike, uh, and personally, I prefer the uh, the portrait Marius in the ruins of Carthage rather than this. But uh, yes, I think he's been through a lot of sacking and a lot of ruins, <laughs> a lot of and seven times elected consul. I mean, the, he had quite a career, and. Uh, interestingly, he was close to the individual who will become his greatest enemy, and we'll be talking about him in a moment, and his name is Sulla. Sulla. Another, I guess, it's like the two egos were just too strong there because in many ways, he trained Sulla, and Sulla used many of the same tactics in terms of developing armies with what you might say is an all-volunteer force, or people who are brought in by recruiting and are, with good reason, loyal to their particular general. This particular picture of Sulla indicates an individual that I think does not seem, I don't know if you say he's not happy, maybe he was happy, maybe he did some things that you just don't see that happiness in the expression. You think he's had a bad day or 
<laughs> it's just not, you know, some folks just aren't happy. It's not, they just, but he was a uh, brilliant general, and after Marius' time, he will utilize the position of dictator in a way that Cincinnatus would have found shocking. But hey, it's the first century before Christ, and things he feels are different. If you had to characterize Marius, you would assume he was associated with the populares faction in the terms of the leadership. Whereas, and it is a very divided society. You know, you hear so much about all that. It's very divided. Well, <laughs> that's the Romans, very divided. But again, if you're talking Sala, you're talking Marius, they're definitely part of the privileged few. They are definitely part of the high ruling class. But it just happens he's part of this optimate group. And those are the individuals that say all leadership to the privileged few. Now, when you think of privileged few, you always remember that doesn't necessarily mean people who can trace their roots back to the early republic. It just means people who've been around long and made the right marriage here and there and now they can be just as uppity <laughs> as the rest of them. High classes in dynamic societies have a way of expanding. They have to, don't they, or they would die out. And so in this case, Sala's family background and his political inclinations cause him to be part of these optimates, and he definitely would like nothing to do with the programs of the Gracchi and others. Now you might wonder why would soldiers like to join his forces? And I'll tell you exactly, because they win. And that means that they're going to get paid. And that means that they have lots of opportunities at looting. And all the rest, enslaving people, and all the rest that make this a great advantage to be associated with him. And I suppose over time that his interests and Sulla's interests parted company as he advanced, and so they became bitter competitors. Ultimately, he will actually take over Rome and with the consent of those in control, he will make himself, or he will have them make him, I guess I should say. Either one is, I think make himself is a better way to put it, but of course, technically, he will have the Senate appoint him dictator for the emergency. In other words, we have troubles, and so according to Roman tradition, I want to take care of Rome, uh, but then I'll be finished. As it was, and as you can see, he will be in there for several years. And during that time, he is going to... <laughs> uh, shall we say, make a lot of enemies. But at the same time, he is going to change Rome clearly. Now, what was he like? Well, Plutarch, I don't think Plutarch liked him. So let's let Plutarch speak. Because you think, you think about people like Sulla, you think, oh, they have no hobbies. Or, you know, they're so busy killing and brutalizing and getting mad and conquering, but he always had time for love. It chanced they were sitting near Sulla, and I guess they were at a performance of some sort, a woman of great beauty and splendid birth. Well, the big two, there you go. 
And so it happened that she had recently been divorced. Oh. As she passed along behind Sulla, she rested her hand upon him, plucked a bit of nap from his mantle, and then proceeded to her own place. When Sulla looked at her in astonishment, she said, It is nothing of importance, dictator, but I too wish to participate a little in thy felicity. <laughs> oh, shucks. <laughs> So, Sulla was not displeased at hearing this. <laughs> Nay, it was at once clear that his fancy was tickled. <laughs> For he secretly sent and asked her name and inquired about her family yeah, and her history. Then followed mutual glances, continual turnings of the face to gaze, interchanges of smile. And at last, a formal compact to marriage. Boy, they got down to it. I mean, <laughs> but, I mean you, got, you have so much time for flirting and uh, doing all that. And then, all right, let's bring the lawyers on in and get the accountants and let's get this thing going. Uh, yeah, that's, that's an interesting tale of Sala's religion. And again, uh, I don't think, I mean, she was a divorcee, so obviously folks had been around. So it's not that they were inexperienced. But I would like to tell you that they lived in nuptial bliss. <laughs> That's what I'd like to tell you. But it would be a lot. And I'm not going to have that on me. I'm going to tell you the truth. Sala ran around. All this was perhaps blameless on her part, but Sala, even though she was ever so chaste and reputable, did not marry her for a start worthy motive. He was led away like a young man, and he wasn't, by looks and languishing airs. <laughs> oh, we love languishing airs, right? through which the most disgraceful and shameless passions are naturally excited. <laughs> the preceding was a paid address by Plutarch, yes. He gets that in just in case any of the Plutarch readers are thinking of going out for debauchery. And he's thinking, see, this is what happens. Uh, so Plutarch could be uh, quite a moralist, right? But, even though he had such a wife, and watch out if you know people like this, he consorted with actresses, harpists, and theatrical people. <laughs> Those are the big three. <laughs> the, the most, yeah, big into debauchery. They, those harpists, that's a rough crowd at the, the party scene. Well, you know about musicians. and Drinking with them on couches. Then it back, and I guess. So that's our Sulla. And you're thinking that's his idea of relaxation, you know, the idea of, oh, it's been a busy day ruling Rome, but now I'm going to get me some, get there with some uh, cellists and harpists, and then uh, just get uh, a real good time. But that is what we are told about him. All of this while he is uh, apparently leading Rome. Because I have to tell you that he was serious about leading Rome. And by serious, I mean what we could say is purging, cleansing, and the prescription list. Prescriptions list sort of like Rome's most wanted. And the idea being that almost, after, almost immediately after he took over, he would begin to publish these, not merely in Rome, but apparently in other Italian cities. And in every case, it's simply political enemies. And 
these individuals are more or less wanted dead or alive, just like the old. In other words, you had that right and their property was confiscated. And all you had to do was be on his bad side. And I wonder how could people have survived all that. And I think it probably had a lot to do with you just keep quiet and mind your manners. And you are not one of the more outspoken. Because obviously not everybody gets wiped out here. But those on the prescriptions list are both prominent and highly significant. And I have the sense that people were willing to turn on their one-time neighbors and friends in order for rewards. And so this is a fairly bloody internal period while he is, in effect, cleansing the senatorial aristocracy of those who opposed him. And that's what this is all about. I mean, they'll grow back. It's interesting that, you know, you do these things, but you know how it goes, time will bring new ones. It is um, a great day for the optimates, those who optimates because they are Sulla's party. And what he will do is eliminate uh, populares and then appoint new members of the optimates to the Senate. All of this during that four-year period as a dictator, tyrant, whatever you want to say because he can. He, he just has that level of power. And again, note the years. When you would think uh, they've got everything, they have all this territory. Think of the wealth, think of the cities, think of the incredibly growing and diverse population of Rome and the area. All this is going on. And in the elite case, they just can't seem to work together or handle it because you have, on the one hand, a Marius, and now you have a Sulla. And the prescription lists are very, very effective, for him at least, in eliminating the opposition. When he stepped down, Poor thing, I guess he just wore out, you know, because he's playing, uh, he's lighting both ends of the candle. Because, I mean, you're busy with your prescription list by day, and then you call in those musical folks to come over and get wasted. I mean, it's anything, you know. I, uh, he, he needed to be more moderate because uh, he's a goner shortly after his... Uh, Exit, and he didn't step down all by himself. I mean, it's not like they made him. So he submitted his right thing. He said, I've, I've killed a lot of people. And there's a lot of, lot of bloodshed, and I, you don't have to thank me. I was glad to do it. I'm glad God to help everybody. So, but basically, uh, he felt that he had reestablished the authority of the Optimate, so he's out of there. But he leaves us, of course, another little... Uh, future major figure who is Pompey, and we will come back to him next time. So we always remember where these people are coming at. Her Marius uh, was the uncle of Julius Caesar, and now we find Sulla's protege is Pompey. So it's kind of interesting there. No friend ever served me and no enemy ever wronged me whom I have not repaid in full. Now, <laughs> that, boy, doesn't that say it all? It's like, you know, it's boy, oh boy. It's not like, oh, I know you didn't mean it and I just love you. Just, let's just, let's forget. Yeah, yeah. So this means, in a, 
But that's it. One of Pom, uh, Sala's most uh, famous remarks, and I thought I would pass that on in case you think, oh, I bet he was just a big old loving guy underneath. I <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. Uh, uh, now, who remembers Kirk Douglas, who is now 100 years old? Yes, he is. He's 100. Going strong, and who could forget Spartacus? No, I don't think there are many. Uh, that film, which has so many historical memories for so many reasons, and was such a major film in its day, and really, I think, even since. And just like they say on the commercials, except no substitutes, I gather they were on television series and all this and the other. Let's just stick to the real McCoy. This was the 1960, and you say, but weren't there other people we should know except for Kirk Douglas? Yes, Hollywood fans. <laughs> there, what? there is a veritable plethora. Uh, I mean, could we ask for more? Star-studded. Lawrence Olivier? Mm-hmm. Charles Lawton, Peter Ustinov, Gene Simmons, Tony Curtis. So there you are. And more, but uh, maybe the uh, non-Hollywood history people don't care as much, so I'll let you go. But uh, if you ever want to know who else is in it, like Nina Foch, for those who are really serious uh, old Hollywood people. But that was quite a major film of the day, and uh, I'm afraid that the memories of Spartacus are not as great as they should be, because when you think about slavery, we always now, I guess, think about the example in our own country, and we don't think about the enslaved people in the past. But in fact, we know that in the ancient world, not merely Rome, but Greece before it, in fact, all of them, as far as I'm aware, slavery was part and parcel of their economy. And it had much to do with conquering other peoples, not enslaving one's own peoples, so much as um, taking some of those who were conquered. Now, we've studied in Athens and so forth the idea of enslaving people in debt, and I guess that could be done as well. But I think of the bulk of the enslaved people as being those who had been conquered, and uh, we understand that there were all kinds, as there always are, levels of enslaved people based on their education and level of skills. And there were, as you can imagine, lots and lots of Greek slaves who were more or less put in intellectual positions as teachers and uh, all the rest that were um, quite favored as opposed to those who simply did the harsh work of the latifundia and all the rest. The freedmen and freedwomen become a major group, and I think that's interesting because you don't really call them freemen. You notice I put freed. I think that's such a very important distinction because these people were not born in it. They acquired it because they were emancipated or manumitted by their owners. And a whole class of people like that would develop in Rome. And you can read sometimes about them. Oh, they would have the stigma of being freedmen. But often they made a lot of money. Because other than the stigma of having been enslaved, 
They could own their own businesses and they could become very prominent. And I have seen actually the tombs of some people, you know, like former slaves, and, uh, you know, they were lived quite well. But again, they were emancipated. However, the population of slaves was enormous, and simply because a portion of it, the, that population was emancipated, we do have to bear them in mind. So that brings us to Spartacus and how short a period it really is. That movie, I think, was quite lengthy, as I recall, but uh, uh, in relative terms, this rebellion of Spartacus was quickly put down. Uh, 73, 72, would more or less indicate it. Now, they tell us that regardless of the movie or other things we've heard, that Spartacus, a gladiator, not a Roman necessarily, probably had no well-developed ideology of freedom or was a John Brown figure necessarily so much as becoming a leader of slaves in rebellion. Because these, after all, were individuals who were going to participate in gladi gladiatorial events. So uh, that is not a particularly happy kind of vocation and the individuals who presumably had been captured and thus ended up trained, oh, they had a training school and all the rest, uh, had rebelled and under this charismatic individual uh, went in various parts of the empire terrorizing the locals until they were crushed. It's amazing to think, though, because it's amazing to think how, how they come up with these estimates, but it's amazing to think that that many thousands of people could have been brought together without discipline or without order necessarily. I mean, not to be elitist about it, but you wonder how people could be uh, organized and how Spartacus and others could have been articulate enough to command that kind of authority. Nevertheless, it is said that, uh, in Plutarch, no less, that these people uh, assembled and went forth on their mission until they were finally stopped by no one less than Crassus. But you know him as Sir Lawrence Olivier. <laughs> Crassus. And Crassus, of course, who's going to be very important in the next class. Uh, I mean, these are really previews of coming attractions when we're talking about, you know, the first half of the first century before Christ, if you stop and think about it, because they're all uh, coming up uh, into roles, because he proved himself to Roman leadership by his army's defeat of Spartacus and his men. The depiction of this, of the crucifixion along the Appian Way was uh, supposed to have been uh, quite a sight by those, and it was meant to be, uh, apparently there was nothing more grotesque because that's a long way from, some of you have probably been there, from Rome to Capius all the way down south. I think it's about 100 miles maybe. Um, and you think if they were doing that, it was for a purpose. And it was, of course, to tell other slaves this is what happens. 
So it is a, a terrible thought that they were willing to do this in order to maintain Roman, this particular ancient institution, but apparently it worked for them. Uh, the Crassus and Spartacus, those names will go on forever, but one name that I want to close with today is one that I would like for more people to know. And you say, why? Well, because think 1919. And how many people do we know from 1919? Well, not necessarily that many, but you're going to know one now. There she is, Rosa Luxemburg. Think Berlin, 1919. Oh, the swinging clubs of Berlin? Not so much. We just lost a war, a big war. And there are a lot of unhappy people. And this is part of what would be called, yes, the Spartacist Re Re Rebellion. Rosa Luxemburg and others were part of a kind of communist movement and guess who they named themselves for? Spartacus. That's right, they knew their Roman history. And so she was a leader of this movement. Unfortunately, uh, Rosa did not make it past the suppression of the 1919 movement because the German government decided uh, people like they were troublemakers. But the movement, as I said, like that of Gracchus Babeuf in 1797, show us that these figures from Roman history often take on a life of their own because they give their names uh, to movements of the future. So that helps us remember them. And so I never want to forget Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, don't forget him either, who uh, led that because if somebody should ask you what was happening in 1919 Berlin, you'll want to remember those names. Thank you all very much, and I look forward to seeing you next time. <laughs>